And here we are with today's guest, as announced in the beginning. It's Don Komarechka, almost, almost a regular, right? <laughs> I'm glad doing? to be back. You haven't gotten tired of me yet. No, not at all. Actually, um, when you ta talked about uh, your book last time, we, uh, we, we, we agreed that you should come back when it's getting much, much closer to uh, completion. And I think we are there. So just, uh, just as a quick introduction again, um, I think many people might know you from your uh, Snowflakes book and um, the Sky Crystals. And um, you have also looked into like a whole bunch of things. I, I think mad scientist is the right term for you. I, and, um, I love that term. In fact, if I, I don't know if it's in reach here, but I, I do I do have a propeller hat here that I could put on. <laughs> there and we go. So that's, uh, I'm not going to wear that for the show, but. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Uh, so uh, anyway, um, yeah, I, yeah. Pe people have seen you here. So, is there anything you want to add in terms of uh, introducing? Uh, I, I love to tinker and experiment and, and see mm -hmm. the world through not my own eyes, uh, like not the world that I would normally be aware of. And I did a um, a video recently for DP Review TV where I took this uh, beastly contraption of a camera that uh, uses uh, ultraviolet light to take images. And uh, so this is a modified Lumix S1 with a very special Nikon Rayfact uh, ultraviolet transmissive lens and filters that block visible light but let ultraviolet light pass through. I know these from infrared. infrared. Yeah, I, yeah I know. and so... Uh, the, these filters have to block not only the visible spectrum, but also all of the infrared spectrum. Because if about 1% of the infrared light gets through to the sensor, that equals about the entirety of the ultraviolet light that the camera is sensitive to. Uh, <laughs> and, and so it's a really tricky thing to use. And about the only thing that you can see is, you know, uh, defects in people's skin if you're a dermatologist, um, and patterns in flowers that insects can see that we can't. But um. that's a fun subject to explore, so I did some of that. Again, that puts that mad scientist moniker uh, in its proper place when I start to do those sorts of things. <laughs> so, um, infrared, uh, ultraviolet, um, and the macro thing, of course. And I think that's why, we, that's, that's why I got you back here to tell us a bit about the book that is going to come out and maybe some yeah, of the things and behind the scenes. I think that's what everyone's interested in. Um, and let's take a look at a few concepts that I've been exploring over the last, let's say, two years. Since I started producing the book uh, and have evolved, made mistakes, and come across some serendipitous moments along the way. Um, so why don't you bring up the, the first image that I have here, Chris, because I just think that this go. is so much fun. Um, this, uh, my wife doesn't like because she's a beautiful, talented, abstract oil painter. And she sees this and she says, that's as good as the stuff that I could do that would take me months to create. And you did this overnight. <laughs> um, and, and so uh, this is citric acid crystals um, that are being cross-polarized. But by the way, anyone who's listening to this right now as the audio podcast, this would be the point where you click the link in the description that takes you to the video version because <laughs> right. I, I think it's worth uh, seeing those photos and not just hearing about them. Sorry, go on. Uh, uh, well, and to describe it, it's a, it's a wash of colored crystals, almost like a wave of a waterfall transitioning from blues to yellows to then whites and then to some dark grays across the frame with what looks like little rocks amidst this wave of crystals that are deferring the flow of it. Um, and uh, this is uh, one such example. Another uh, simple example. And citric acid is an easy thing, um, uh, an easy thing to to get. Uh, Amazon sells it. I'm sure you can get it on eBay. Health food stores would sell it too. Um, and this version of it looks almost like feathers of a bird's wing. Um, and uh, same exact ingredients, same exact setup, and it's remarkably easy to do. Except so when wait, you make wait, mistakes wait, and break things. Let's let's go back to the colors on this. So they come from what exactly? So. Um, he, uh, the, the phenomenon is called birefringence, uh, more commonly called cross-polarization, where um, if you have a polarized light source and you have another polarizer on your camera that's in opposition to that or otherwise blocking the light, normally you know, polarizers in opposition, you'd, you'd see nothing. It'd be black unless there's something in between that, for lack of a physics lesson, mucks with the angles of light. Um, and if it 
if it changes the angles of light in particular ways, then when it passes through the other polarizer, it blocks the original light source, but it doesn't block the light that has changed direction in between. And that can create some crazy colors. You can do this test with a simple like piece of uh, cheap plastic that I don't know why I have like a piece of packaging from something uh, mm -hmm. that's just still sitting on my desk. That would create rainbow colors. Um, you know, so, cheap so Christmas you need ornaments. Two, you need two polarizers cutlery. that that this goes in between. Pretty much. That's exactly it. That's yeah. exactly it. And, and and I'll show you the setup that uh, that that this this is a fairly complex setup when you look at the image on the right because I'm attaching a microscope objective to my camera to get mm -hmm. high magnification. You can do this with the Canon MPE lens. Lyoa has uh, other lenses that'll get five or you know uh, within the ballpark of what I'm doing here. The image on the right, um, this uh, it's basically a flashlight with a polarizing filter on it and a microscope slide on a crab clamp with a polarizing filter just resting on top of it. This is like a totally MacGyvered cross-polarizing microscope. It doesn't sound too uh, complicated. It's not that complicated at all, except I didn't expect the LED light to put out as much heat as it did, and heat destroys polarizing film and so I completely destroyed a very expensive breakthrough filters polarizing filter in the process of learning Oops. a lesson the hard way. Yeah, LEDs do so. do make heat. That's a thing. Yes, maybe not as much as a, as a, as a incandescent light bulb, but but when um, you're blocking yeah. the output and it's just all coalescing on on the filter, I've yes. since learned yeah, put a gap there and that problem is solved. So don't follow my exact <laughs> diagram here because you will break things in the process. Um, so that was a fun little experiment, and you don't have to use citric acid. You can use ascorbic acid, otherwise known as vitamin C, um, tartaric acid, uh, MSM, a very complex and chemical name. And they will name. all look very different? or They'll all look very different, all incredibly different. Um, in these cases, what I'm doing is I'm just making a solution with water uh, and then letting it dry on a microscope slide. And as it dries, it crystallizes. And that's it. Uh, so... It's uh, maybe a good experiment to do in the winter time when the air is less humid, so it'll dry even faster, uh, mm. and uh, you'll get results within a couple of hours. You could set up a whole bunch of slides, uh, go to bed, wake up in the morning, and right now, sometimes it's hard for people to have a reason to get out of bed, uh, and so this would be a great reason to jump out of bed and go see what crystals you made overnight. So awesome. that that was fun. Wonderful. Um, Again, you know what? You want? I really like that. Um, that you give away those secrets. There are so many photographers out there who have like their secret method, their secret sauce, and they and but but um, just being that open and sharing how this can be done with everyone. And I learned I from is... others doing the same thing as well. And and Chris, I, I want to share another image that uh, sure, illustrates a. Um, this is the image that started my photographic career. Okay, I, I call it Maple Leaf Flag, and mm -hmm. uh, it's it, it's a photograph that. Uh, you know, it's red maple leaves, real leaves on a bed of fresh snow. And I did that image over a decade ago. And I thought, you know, with some s techniques that I've been seeing from other photographers that are like freezing flowers and things in water, and you get these weird bubbles and stuff that show up. Mo Devlin was a, was a guy that I saw recently uh, in a presentation, and he was also very free with his techniques. And so I took that uh, uh, to hand and I decided to create a version of this now in 2020 uh, with instead of it being staged outside on snow it's recreated um, inside of ice itself <laughs> and so this is a block of ice you froze that inside there yeah well it's a very thin block of ice and uh, you know it's just the same I actually went back to my old neighborhood where I used to live and I gathered leaves from the same trees to be as authentic as I could to the original um, and this is the first time anybody's seeing it because I'm still working on it I might tweak some colors and uh, you know adjust some brightness and, and what have you on that um, real but, behind the scenes yeah, look that's awesome <laughs> exactly but th this is uh, this is what it was um, just a whole bunch of LED flashlights and this sheet of ice with um, uh, with leaves encapsulated within that and uh, that uh, that's that's what the magic was. That's all it um, takes. So wow. sometimes it's really inventive from a sort of a gorilla standpoint. Like you make your subject. Uh, this is entirely manufactured by me in order to then create a photograph uh, that results from that. But but I did want to talk about um, this image in particular, Chris, because um, at least the the first version of it, um, th this guy right here. This not only is my most famous photograph, but it's also my most stolen photograph um <laughs> I, I couldn't imagine i think i've seen that several times online yes 
Uh, do you ever uh, have your photos taken without permission and do you do anything about uh, copyright infringement and enforcement? Um, I don't do anything about it, but yes, I get pictures stolen. Um, it has yet to happen that someone is using them in a commercial context, like printing them on t-shirts and then selling them. That's That hasn't, well, to my knowledge, hasn't happened before. But if someone puts that on their blog to illustrate something, then that's fine. If they... If if I have a watermark on there and they crop that out, I get a bit um, antsy and I I, I send out takedown notices in, in those cases. But, I've asked people um, to to take something down, not not in official fashion, but just as an email saying, "Hey, that's not okay. Could you do this?" And I've I've, are, I've done that before. People comply. Uh, I've done that before, but I sometimes get very belligerent comments, like mm -hmm. "Go f yourself" uh, mm -hmm. to uh, to censor it. But um, oh, then so that I just, would probably that stresses ramp up me my out. Game, yes. So I often just sort of avoid doing that and just send out DMCA takedown notices, especially if it's on a social media platform like Facebook yeah. or Twitter. Then it's easy. Yeah. Uh, and then you just fill out the form. So I had somebody on on Twitter recently um, say, and quite arrogantly uh how dare you uh, uh when they were using this image as the header photo on their twitter account for branding um and and i schooled them you can check out my, my twitter account you know my handle is is right below me uh wherever that happens to be right about there um that uh that, that that's my pinned tweet right now and that'll stay there for a little while where you can go and uh and enjoy um a little rant on copyright but that comes up everywhere i mean if you want to focus on my camera uh for a second chris I just want to show this wonderful thing, which is a book um, printed in Turkey um, about religion or uh, Islam of some kind. I'm not mm. sure exactly what they were trying to do using my maple leaf flag image as the cover photo that um, is on a book in, in pretty Turkish. Bold. <laughs> That's, That's pretty, pretty bold. bold. I have not yet been able to find a, uh, a lawyer in Turkey willing to take that case on. Um, mm. But uh, I, I deal with commercial infringements all the time, and it's so frustrating, especially when you know you do your best work and then people just yeah. steal it. So anyhow, that's that that is what it is. And uh, I've sent over a thousand takedown notices this year alone. I mean, it, it's a it's a big thing, um, not just for this image. There's a bunch of my work that gets stolen. Yeah. Um, and sometimes it's tricky. You know, I, I've even had to resort, especially for foreign language websites to uh, to go to, um, uh, you know, find the IP address for the website. Uh, which is easy to do. You can just like type ping in the command command prompt, and it you know mm -hmm. shows you uh, where you're going. And then put that into uh, DNS checker, uh, and find the DNS registry entry for that IP address to see who owns it. And whoever owns it almost always has an abuse contact, an email address there. And you send a DMCA takedown notice. It's just a template, and I just switch some names and, and files out, uh, and I send it that way. And uh, and that's more or less they comply unless they're in like Iran or Russia. Um, then they just sometimes just they, they, they respond and they say, no, we're not doing that. Well, see, um, you when you say a thousand this year alone, is that uh, do you do this manually? Do you have someone to help you do that? How does I, that I do work? them manually. I mean, if I'm that's if I'm doing uh, if, if I'm doing uh, infringements, I can do about one a minute. Um, if if I've lined them all up, if I spend like a day uh, having them open as web browser tabs, um, I can fill out that Facebook form so fast, I can do it in like 45 seconds. Mm -hmm. um, and one at a time and at a time and at a time. And, and that's muscle memory stuff. I can be watching, you know, my favorite or listening to my favorite podcast or stuff at the same time. It's it's just like knitting a sweater, I guess, at that point. You know, it's <laughs> it's just what it is. <clears throat> So, so, so yeah. is that is I mean let, let me be blunt here is that also a source of income? Are you, do you send out invoices to people saying uh, you, you can keep using it? You can keep using it, but uh, here's what you would pay for that. Yeah. So uh, t typically, what I would be doing is if there is a commercial infringement uh, where it's in Canada, for example, I've got a mm -hmm. Canadian lawyer that I know I can work with very well, and uh, and I'll send if there's a physical address exactly uh you know where uh where we can send a letter then they're more likely to take it um and uh yeah it there are settlements that arise from that mm -hmm. um from companies and corporations usually i mean for individuals i'll typically send a, a takedown notice but if it's a, a commercial infringement if they're using my photo in, in branding or making money or promoting their company in oh, any way definitely. 
then you got to enforce it. And so what's, uh, what's the ratio between, let's say, the, the really the real bold commercial stuff and the blog that I'd wants say a bit maybe of about three to five percent are really viable commercial infringements. Okay. Um, but that's, you know, if I'm sending out a thousand takedown notices, that's still a lot that are viable to send to a lawyer during that same time period. So um, that, that just kind of, it bugs me that it happens. Um, I, I'm sure people learn the lesson the hard way when they have to pay for it uh, or when their Facebook account gets locked because they used mm -hmm. my image three times in a row and uh, I send takedown notices for every one. And well, uh, what are you going to do? I mean, you could pay Does... me a retroactive license at that point and, and technically then you would have the rights to use it and I can rescind the takedown. But yeah. that gets into the weeds of all of this stuff. And I like to just be a creative person and not have my work stolen. And and, and it takes away time from you to be creative. Um, the question that, I, that I'd also have is um, looking at the co whole copyright uh, thing. It is different in different parts of the world. In Germany, it's different yes. than in the U.S. It might be different than in Canada. So, is there is there a fair use clause in Canada? As yeah, in we America? call it fair dealing. It's uh, it uh -huh. mimics more the U.K.'s version than the U.S.'s version, but they're both okay. very similar. And so, you can use it for satire or parody. Uh, usually, you have to give credit. You can use it for private study or education. Right. But again, uh, for critique purposes, etc. But credit has to be given. It has to be done mm. within a certain context. Um, and uh, and so. If you fail any of those pillars uh, of those requirements, it, it does not qualify. Uh, yes. And so most of the uses do not qualify uh, in that regard. However, um, sometimes it does, and there's nothing I can do. If somebody posts uh, you know, this image online and says, well, take a look at the great work that Don Komarechka did. Um, he did it this way. He did it to, to blah, blah, blah. And they're really reviewing and critiquing my image. Well, they have the right to do that, right? I can't take mm -hmm. that right away from it because that is part of the copyright law. Mm -hmm. um, I would also state that uh, you know a good number of my infringements do come from the U.S., although this one obviously is more centered around Canada. Um, and I, on January 1st and 2nd of this year, I, I had some previously registered images within the U.S., this one and maybe a handful of others. I went through every year's worth of my uh, portfolio work that I've published, and I registered it with the U.S. Copyright Office. And mm -hmm. costs $55 per year of work, uh, up to 750 images. Uh, and all it is is filling out forms and spreadsheets and just, you know, hitting a pay button at the end. And uh, that, to go back over 12 years of work, uh, took me a day and a half to do. Uh, okay, and not so bad. I, I could, yeah, and I did have to spend like six, seven hundred dollars US to get everything registered in my portfolio. But what that's does an registration get you? Because we don't have that here in Germany. We, we have it here in Canada technically, although it doesn't change the metrics when you want to go and enforce a claim. Um, but in the US, if you don't register your copyright, you can claim actual damages, what you might have licensed an image to somebody for. But no lawyer is going to take on a case like that unless it's a really, really big yeah. scenario. Um, so by registering your copyright, you can claim statutory damages uh, against the use of your image. And those numbers go incredibly high. Um, so much so that lawyers are willing to work on contingency as a result, meaning that they would get a percentage of whatever the settlement is if it does get settled. So as soon as you find a viable commercial infringement, you no longer have to pay out front for your legal uh, legal services in order to defend that. And that's where it becomes viable for people um, uh, to, uh, to, to fight you know, the good fight to protect their work. And if everybody did this a little bit more often, I think it would be more in the public eye that people shouldn't just do a Google image search and find something and then realize, oh, it's on Google, it must be free to use because it yeah. most certainly isn't and ignorance is not a defense. So what do you do to track down the images? What do you use a special service? Do you have any, if you can tell us any hidden, hidden. Yeah, I, I do use it, stuff? A, a special service. Um, there's a, a website called infringement.report. And that, that's the URL. Report is the TLD. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, infringement.report. They, they've got a trial account if you want to throw up, I think, three images to see how it works. Uh, I pay, I think it's $25 US a month to upload 300 images, and they will scan through 
all sorts of different resources where the images show up online. Your images become a search term mm -hmm. and, uh, and they give you a daily report. Um, if you want to just see where an image might show up because you think it might have been popular and shared around, um, you can use the Google Images search engine. Uh, Bing.com slash images works as well. I don't use Bing for anything really, but its image algorithm is different than Google's and it finds different results. Uh, and so too, uh, and is actually quite good, is Yandex, the, uh, the Russian search engine. Um, their reverse image search algorithm is still different from everybody else's. It has more misses uh, than solid hits, but some of those misses are people that have heavily modified the image by like <laughs> putting text over top of it uh, to advertise themselves. Um, and uh, that's a derivative work for which I still own the copyright to. And so I use those services and there's others, but that's enough to get most people started and uh, to start discovering. And for infringement.report, if, if they find one viable infringement in a year uh, that you can send to a lawyer, it more than pays for the entire year's worth of that service. And, um, and so that's, uh, that's how I go about it. And um, I hope more photographers do the same because if you just let people walk all over you silently, you don't know what's happening, um, that people are stealing your work, then they'll continue to not only steal your work, but others because they just don't have the knowledge that it's wrong and that itself is wrong so ah <sighs> back to the book so yeah. <laughs> you've you've um you've been how, how much time have you have you spent in putting the macro but what, what's the official title of it again uh macro photography the universe at our feet and and oh. i can say that the number of hours is in the thousands um yeah. in order to not only do page layouts and the writing um and uh and all of the work to create the images and shooting the behind the scenes stuff and creating language that everybody can understand um there was one part that i was describing the true effect of cross polarizing crystals that we just saw um and it took me two or three days to write two or three paragraphs just to make sure i got the science right bounced it off of actual scientists that understood this stuff, but distilling it down into terms that my wife could read and understand what was happening. Um, and so that's, that's a lot of people take that for granted, uh, that those are just simple words and they come together and they can read it and understand it. There's a lot going on behind the scenes and a lot of research to make sure mm -hmm. that what I'm saying is right. And in fact, when I wrote Sky Crystals, I got a fact wrong that slapped me in the face when I was making this new book. Uh, and that's that every lens um, that has an f-stop number on the barrel, that's measured at infinity focus. And as you get closer and closer to the closest focusing distance, that number actually changes. It's a fluid <laughs> number. And by the time you get to one-to-one -one macro magnification, you actually add two stops to whatever that was at infinity. I always oh, thought really? it was one stop. It's two stops. And it was cl clear as day, if I were to look up the, uh, the manual for the Canon MPE 65 millimeter uh, macro lens, which goes from 1x to 5x magnification, it doesn't focus to infinity. Yet its theoretical aperture at infinity is f2.8. Oh, so and they so sell it as an f2.8 even though you will never be able to get to f2.8 with it? Yeah, the, the widest <laughs> aperture is f5.6 um, because it's a universal standard that every yeah. lens is measured at infinity, whether or not they can get there. And um, <laughs> How do they measure it? That's my question. I, I don't know, maths. But yeah. um, I looked at page eight of the manual for that lens. It says if you're shooting at f2.8 and at one-to-one -one magnification, your effective aperture is f5.6. Um, and it was just like a mind explosion for me to yeah. realize that every lens does this uh, in every context. When you get closer, your effective aperture gets smaller. Uh, and uh, so that was a fun little moment of learning for me. And, oh, but uh, it, isn't, this is kind of normal. I mean, uh, making mistakes and putting a, something as complex as a book together, especially the kind of stuff that you put together, um, when Monica and I put uh, wrote the uh, the film photography handbook, we uh, we just missed an important entire paragraph about a method to develop a large format film in a in a simple way. Speaking which, of large format film, Chris, yeah. I just took a delivery of uh, uh, Kodak Portra 400 in 11 by 14 sheets. Oh, okay, that's pretty <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Yeah, they don't, they don't make it separately anymore. Um, they, um, uh, you have to do it like a bulk order and you have to buy like 500 sheets right. at a time. And, and it used to be people would uh, do like a group buy on it, but the number of sheets, it ends up costing something like $33 a sheet and you'd have to buy a box of 50. 
Um, but this year they uh, they dropped the uh, the the quantity per box down to ten. And uh, so I bought a box of 10 sheets. I have an 11 by 14 studio film. It's taller than I am, mm -hmm. um, uh, a studio camera. And uh, so now I've got some film for it once I finish its uh, restoration. It's just stuck in my freezer until that happens. That is wild. So, <laughs> so the book, um, you ran this on Kickstarter. The campaign is long funded. Um, you are putting the finishing touches on the book right yeah, now. Yeah, um, I was actually working on the post-processing section just before our call Did started. Do you do all this on your own? Are you working with someone to help uh, you with lay out? And... Uh, no, I do all the layouts, all the writing, all the That's images awesome. and, and everything else. Um, I, although I, I will say that I've had a lot of people helping me uh, do grammar. And I've got one person on the page role uh, that is uh, double checking you know the the spelling and, and the grammar and um, and making sure that the things make sense that I didn't use the same common word too many times in the same paragraph yeah. etc uh, just to make sure that it's really well read and um, and so that's all done for every page layout that's been completed the the last section that needs to be done post-processing and then uh, table of contents which I won't do until everything else is set an index at the back side and I want to write a nice epilogue saga of what the heck happened between the Kickstarter campaign and the final book production through a pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, all the trials and, and grief and stress and lack of productivity, dealing with family life and so so, uh, so much else. So, um, But Chris, I want to share one more interesting image sequence of course, uh, for us to take a look here. at. We still have that image up. Uh, if I can uh, jump over, if it... It's not letting me if jump you, if over. You, if you click the gear icon, you can share something else. Uh, yeah, let's just go ahead and, uh, and bring up... Oh, none of these windows are actually working. Oh, here we go. Forgive the uh, the dead oh, no air worries. here, everybody. Um, oh, that's 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 uh, just a look behind the scenes of how this is done. Yeah, because so I'll, I'll because what we're doing, we're using. Um, let me let me just give you some background on what we're using here for the video production. So there's a there's a tool out there called OB, OBS Ninja, which is um, separate from the OBS switcher. It's a it's nothing to do with it other than you can use it with OBS and that transmits video at high quality audio at high quality f over continents and that's what we're doing here so we have two streams coming in from you it's uh well three streams actually it's a video stream an audio stream and a screen share stream and, so uh, i'm looking at your actual screen there uh well y yes you are and it's a 4k display and so sending that across the uh, the internet to germany is is time at, consuming and at low latency so um because in, instead of you telling me which picture to share from a pdf that you sent me it's much much easier if you just share a screen and it, it, except that uh except chrome doesn't is want in, to share it, now <laughs> chrome is in a state of crashing um i it's still apparently i'm can you still see me and hear me that's yes, fine but see, 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 uh, uh, but uh, otherwise chrome is unresponsive so so uh, I'm not going to touch it right now, and uh, and uh, I, I will describe the image, and and maybe you no, can. No, no, uh, no, no, no. We'll we'll make a cut here and okay. magically reemerge on the other side with your shared screen in three, two, one. There we go. It worked magically. So, <laughs> what what are you sharing with us here? So th this is a flower, um, a uh, gooseneck loosestrife for anybody keeping track of flowers at home. And it doesn't look all that interesting right now, but I have some in my garden. And uh, every couple of weeks, I'll take an ultraviolet flashlight around the garden and just see what responses I get from the flowers that are out there. Some are dull; they don't fluoresce at all. But you would be surprised, Chris, how many flowers when hit with an ultraviolet light, will bounce visible light back at you. And uh, I've been shocked at this so many times, but I'm still continuously discovering new things. Uh, so wait, and so wait, wait you're, you're using an ultraviolet flash, but a regular normal camera, and then exactly. you get a, vi a visible light response. That is so, uh, interesting. For yeah. The, the technical uh, answer here is the ultraviolet light excites the electrons around specific atoms, and those electrons uh, with higher energy go to a higher orbit, but very briefly. It's pretty well instantaneously. They can't hold that. They're a very poor battery, and they release that. They go back to their original orbit. When they release that energy, they release it in visible light, uh, light that's at a lower energy level than the light that originally excited them to begin with, because energy is lost in the process. Um, and so that means ultraviolet light can, in a way, create visible light um, on an atomic level. 
And, uh, you know, as sciencey as that is, oh, it becomes just beautiful as a result because <gasps> this Look is that, that flower um, under ultraviolet light. And is that just one flash? Uh, that's, uh, I believe this was a flashlight, uh, an ultraviolet flashlight. Oh, a flashlight even, okay. Um, and uh, I may have light painted across over a slightly longer exposure just to make sure that I had things evened out a little bit. Sure. Um, but, so uh, so you, can, you can see that with your eyes if you... If you oh yeah, this is light, completely yeah. visible to your own vision. So when I'm yeah. out hunting around the garden, I'll spot something right away that gathers my attention. And so there's no, no, no trial did. and error, you, you immediately know if what flower gives you what kind of response. Exactly. Now, how you frame it and how you create a of viable course. image out of that, that just becomes the next step. And yeah. so I thought to myself, you know, I've got some ingredients here that I haven't used for a long time that I've been just wondering what I could do. What, what if I were to pick some of these flowers? And, and I have this geode. Uh, and I, I bought it because it was neat. It was open on both ends. And I've always been wondering what I could do with it, like this crystal tunnel. And I thought, well, what if I take um, some of those little flowers and I put them inside this little crystal tunnel and make them glow, right? And I thought, well, that opening is pretty small, but I have uh, the, uh, the Liowa 24 millimeter probe lens mm -hmm. um, that has this like rifle barrel like end on it. And there was a moment of discovery here that I didn't expect, Chris, because... Um, and it's, and uh, it's a wide angle. Uh, it's, too, it's a wide so, angle yeah. in a small space. And so I yeah. thought that might work really nice. Um, but I didn't expect that the the, uh, the lens has a, a ring of LEDs around uh, uh, around the the optics itself. And you could plug in a battery and, and, and illuminate that way. I wasn't going to do that. I was going to light from behind with an ultraviolet light. But it turns out that LED lights, the technology in LEDs, uses fluorescence. And, and so these lights on their own, not even being on, when the ultraviolet light hits them, they <laughs> fluoresce. They, they produce light. They produce light. Um, and so, okay, well now I've got this light coming in from behind. Um, and so I've got this big uh, LED uh, flashlight and you can see the orange glow inside the geode. That's not from any light source. That's from the fluorescence of the LED lights around the lens. That and that was crazy. just such a welcome ingredient into this framing. Uh, and so here I am tinkering away with all this stuff in my studio after I discovered those flowers uh, the night before and I slept on it. And this is what came to me in my sleep, uh, is this concept, this idea. And I put those puzzle pieces together. Um, and uh, this was the, the final result of, of that image, um, uh, the concept being wow. executed fully. No, no wonder people are stealing your photography. I mean, <laughs> that is so mind this, blowing. I, I, but it's a, a connection of so many different ingredients and some of them unexpected. Like I did not expect to have this almost like fireside glow yep. coming from the lens itself uh, that changed the, the light in the foreground to give a perfect contrast into the background. And Oh, and I mean, uh, look, look at the shadows those petals uh, throw on themselves. Uh, it's just, um, yeah, that's, that's, that's like from a different planet. <laughs> uh, well, I'm, I'll take that as a compliment. And uh, this yeah. was a late stage addition uh, to uh, the macro photography book, which um, has a section. It gets distilled from um, uh, the, the bare basics and understanding what lenses and gear do what and why you want to use certain things to controlling aperture to a deep lesson in diffraction that gets distilled down to common points we can all appreciate. And then we go into various different topics, you know, uh, uh, water uh, droplets and refractions and uh, snowflakes and freezing soap bubbles and ultraviolet fluorescence, like this kind of stuff. Um, but then one of my favorite sections of the book I call the masterclass, where it takes all of the knowledge requ uh, that was dished out in the first part of the book and combines it together in all of the different ingredients. You know, uh, this case, I need to understand uh, uh, diffraction and ultraviolet fluorescence uh, and, uh, and, and all the elements of macro photography for depth and focus stacking and uh, all that kind of coalesces into an image like this. And so once you have all of those puzzle pieces together, that part of the book shows you how they can all fit together in really interesting ways. So yeah, it's been fun. Oh, I, I imagine. So where exactly in the in the process are you right now? Um... So I, I've, uh, I've signed the, the documents for, uh, for the press to go ahead and start ordering materials. And, uh, and so that's, that's going along. My files in date is currently the end of this month. So I've got uh, like two weeks uh, uh, 
or so uh, before everything has to be completely finalized and in. Um, and uh, I'm not sure exactly what the press schedule is going to be like at this point, um, but uh, I'm aiming for a 2020 release. I hope I, I, I'm dependent on on when they can uh, schedule things in at this point. So we're, but, we're recording this mid-October 2020. So Right. Uh, um, and I don't know when you're going to air it, Chris, but uh, hopefully by the time you do, I will be almost ready to throw a, a party and say, you know, pop a cork out of a champagne bottle and say, hey, the book is done. <laughs> make, make sure you do a slow-mo sh- shot of that cork popping. Um, exactly. So um, uh, I'm, I'm a backer, so I'm looking forward to getting a copy as soon as, as, as it's ready. Um, if anyone else wants to get a copy of it, um, you will, you're probably going to... F- going to serve the the kickstarter backers first right oh absolutely yeah and then uh, people have been pre-ordering it since then and uh, it's basically going to be um from all the kickstarter backers i'm probably going to ship out a bunch uh, from like really far off locations on the first day of me shipping like australia and Mm. and places like that just because i know it's going to take longer to get there um and then pretty well in the order in which the uh the orders were placed right so So where uh, where can people order it if they want to so you can still order it uh at uh it piggybacks off of my snowflake book website because the e-commerce is System was already set up, and that is at skycrystals.ca. So skycrystals.ca. skycrystals.ca. I'll definitely put that in the show notes. Anything else you want to send people to? This uh, is your chance. Well, uh, I would say my podcast as Photo Geek Weekly, and you've mm-hmm. been a guest on it a number of oh, times, yeah. and uh, photogeekweekly.com, uh, which we just pull stories down from the, the news cycle. Uh, this uh, this week's, as we recorded, uh, has all sorts of interesting implications as to how LiDAR improves mobile photography because of the new iPhone launches and what that means going forward when people really start to get innovative with that. Mm-hmm. And we just go down all of these different rabbit holes, and uh, we have so much fun with it. So uh, check that out at Photo Geek Weekly, and uh, of course, my website has been at the bottom the entire time for those watching on video. Uh, if you're listening, doncom.ca, D-O-N-K-O-M.ca. Everything is linked to there. Okay, and last question before I let you go. Um, iPhone 12 mini or Pro Max? Pro, iPhone 12 Pro. Um, <laughs> you want the LiDAR. <laughs> uh, well, I, I want the LiDAR. I don't want the, the bigger phone. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't agree with Apple's decision to kind of make a lesser camera on the Pro than the Pro Max in terms mm-hmm. of pixel size of the camera you're going to use most often uh, and uh, sensor shift technology on the extreme wide angle one that's not available on the Pro. And they've, they've done that for generations. I've never liked the fact that they've done it, um, but they're still going to get my money. Okay, and with that, thank you so much, Don, for <laughs> coming on the show. I wish you all the best with the book. I hope the prints turn out well. They will certainly print uh, turn out as as good as you want them. I know that you'll have a very close eye on that. And um, with that, thanks and till next time. Thank you very much.